Okay, brilliant. All right. Um, well, hello again to some of you, for those who joined in the morning. Uh, for everyone else, uh, my name is Derek Groen. I'm uh, a senior lecturer in the computer science department at uh, Brunel University London. Uh, and I'm going to talk about local COVID-19 simulations um, and expansion to national. Um, let me see, before I start my talk, is this working? Yes. I just want to touch briefly on the tutorial this morning uh, for those who have joined because uh, we went through the whole thing and then the very last command I typed in wasn't working, which was frustrating because that would have produced the result at the, at the bottom, which gives you the mean score of the auto validator tool. But unfortunately, the Jupyter notebook platform was quite forgetful of the Python path. Um, so we actually had to pass that on explicitly. Uh, this is the fix for it, which I did in the Fabfleet plugin. So if you pull that plugin and you try the notebook again, it will work. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to tell people that for those who went along this morning. Um, I don't know what is forward or backward. I'm going to find out. In any case, um, I'm going to talk about our local uh, Fluent Coronavirus Simulator, and it's a very much a collaborative effort uh, amongst many, many people in our department, and almost all of them worked on it on a voluntary basis during the pandemic. Um, but some notable names are David Bell, who was our main connecting person with the NHS Trust in London, uh, Anastasia Anagnostu, who is the PI for the Stamina Project, where we have several uh, trials with the code, and uh, several prominent uh, postdocs, including Imran Mahmoud and Arendam Saha. Let's see. So I feel this needs a bit of an origin story because we didn't intend to make uh, a pandemic model, actually. Uh, my background is in various other fields. And up to this point, I was mainly focused on migration modeling, uh, forced displacement, people escaping conflict. And when the pandemic hit, uh, of course, I was as shocked as many of you. And my initial idea was actually to be reviewing models by other people because I have a diverse experience in simulations. And I thought, okay, I could be a good impartial voice to scrutinize other COVID mo models out there as someone outside of the community, but someone very familiar with building models. So that's what I started off doing initially. Uh, I did it on a personal blog, which is not very widely read, but some people picked up on my tweets and then I put a few pieces in the conversation related to that. And I thought, well, that was going to be my role in March. Um, Sorry, yeah, okay, I now have the forward button. Um, but that began to change because there was actually a bit of a gap emerging, at least in my perception and in that of several others. Because in March, April 2020, there was a good range of COVID models, but almost all of them operated on a national level. And for those people that managed individual hospitals or individual hospital trusts, those models were not that informative to actually make predictions about how many ICU beds uh, they would need to reserve or when or if they can scale back uh, non-urgent care and also how these direct intake numbers would change given certain factors. So what happened was that uh, two NHS trusts in the first instance approached us and they said, well, or actually the approach they've done, they said, well, we, we sort of need a, a model on this on how to forecast that. So David Bell came to me and he said, well, Derek, you did migration modeling. Uh, do you think there's any hope of doing this kind of modeling? And well, basically during the first lockdown, um, we tried to put a model together. Um, and it was very much a local collaboration. I had quite a few colleagues in the computer science department who helped me with mining assumptions, scrutinizing the model, trying to place it into context, uh, help with the input data, things like that. And I sort of did a lot of the low level algorithmic coding, which I really love. And I hope I can do it for the rest of my life. Um, the aim of the model was to be local, hyper-local, sub-national, like resolving individual buildings and households to support different lockdowns and other interventions, different viral strains, and later on also to support vaccination uh, efficacies and, and strategies. And the model, inevitably had to be an agent-based model because that's the method that I am familiar with and that I uh, have the most experience with. So um, the way we, we tackled that was basically, we always start with the simulation development approach, which is not just the model, but the whole end-to-end -end from identifying the problem you want to model all the way to either validating what you have or, or doing a forecast. Um, Basically, you select situation, you obtain some data. Using that data, you construct a model. You don't train the model, but they sort of put in the rules, uh, the rules and constraints of the agent-based model. 
they may refine that given certain measures, either from the past or uh, what you expect in the future. You then run your simulation using various tools and then you analyze the thing either to validate whether it's anywhere near accurate or to make a forecast. Now, in the case of the flu and coronavirus simulator of facts, um, we had several aspects that were quite localized. Um, most notably, and I think that took the most effort as well, the geospatial data is directly parsed from OpenStreetMap in many cases. So we actually extract buildings and parks and try to figure out, okay, what is the surface area of this place? And then we load that into the code. That has all sorts of drawbacks and issues, uh, not in the least that the annotation in OpenStreetMap is not necessarily consistent, but it does give an approach that wasn't used by many other groups. And that's why we thought it would be nice to go in that direction. Also, it's quite detailed. Uh, demographic data, because we focus on the local area, we could take local demographics from London boroughs or other places. And then also in terms of the measures, we could actually do very local measures. So if in a certain neighborhood, the compliance rate was much lower with mask wearing in supermarkets, we can actually incorporate that directly in our simulation. Very brief overview about the facts code. So it's written in Python 3. At the moment, we mainly use it for simulations for 100,000 to 300,000 households. And the run, every person is resolved explicitly in the code actually. And the runtime is about well, a couple of hours of simulation on one core. We have a parallel version, but the parallel version doesn't create this, give the same results as the sequential one. So we're still testing it and I'm basically debugging it when I don't have other workloads. Um, and in terms of applications, and this is still for the sequential version, um, we did quite a few forecasting reports for local NHS trusts in, in West London. And through the Stamina project, which is an EU funded project that runs for uh, two years, it's quite large actually, it's 10 million euros, I think. We, have, we also have trials uh, with the UK as a whole through the Health Security Agency, who is a partner in that project, and in three other countries, uh, Lithuania, Turkey, and Bulgaria. Um, and what is quite interesting is that for the UK trial, we're trying to do runs with 2 million households, and that's actually very challenging for the code, and that will require that parallel version. So I need to get going on that really. Um, that parallelization is in progress, but the idea is basically that every household is in a house or perhaps multiple households are in a house. And the idea is simply to distribute the houses across the processes and to duplicate all the other locations. It's a very simple parallelization scheme. How well it performs, I don't know, but my hope is that it will scale to say a node uh, for larger simulations so that at least we can cut down the runtime by an order of magnitude, or perhaps in a good case, two orders of magnitude. Um, I'll spare you the exact details, but yeah, I'm, I'm happy to share those if, uh, if you're interested in that separately. Now, to give you an idea of what we're loading into facts, um, this is the borough of Brent in London. So what we basically do is we extract various um, information from OpenStreetMap. Um, so we look at individual hospital buildings um, in this individual residential areas, not individual houses because they're not annotated in many places, um, parks, leisure, office locations, schools, supermarkets, and shopping. And for most of these location types, we directly extract the service area of the building and we put it into the code. It's actually, it's both hugely detailed and hugely simplified. It's hugely detailed because yes, we do resolve your local supermarket. It's hugely simplified because we only resolve one floor, <laughs> but it's, it's very much a work in progress. Uh, and give a, despite all these limitations, we do get quite nice results in many areas. Um, another thing that we have developed, especially in the last year, is to try and have a really nice, almost human readable record of public health interventions. Now, this is not really human readable because the font is too small and the color scheme is horrible. Um, apologies for that, but this is the way that is actually my editor. Um, but what it basically shows is, for example, here you have the 23rd of March 2020. Uh, for example, it will tell you like, okay, uh, the schools are closed, so all the schools schools are closed except for key workers. We also uh, closed 70% of the shops because the non-essential uh, shops were closed. Uh, we closed all the leisure locations, so no entertainment for the people in the UK. Uh, we thought 75% of the people adhere to social distancing, 5% were wearing masks at that time, but 10% were wearing masks during shopping. Remember in this time and era, back in the days, people didn't really care about masks yet, at least not 
not the masses. That's something that emerged later. And then lastly, we had 96% of the people uh, working from all minus the key workers again. So the idea is that we have that in a YAML file and we as developers can look at it, but also somebody who's not that expert can at least read it and sort of give it a quick sanity check. And this is read in directly by the simulation code and applied on different days. Okay. I can spend a lot of time explaining how we model it. Um, basically, there are four steps. We, we have disease spread on various locations. We have disease spread within, uh, sorry, we progress the disease to ne next stages. So people might be hospitalized, they might die, they might become infectious. That's the first step. Then we have a spread within the household. So people can, you know, infect others in the household. Um, there will be, people will be booking visits on a day to certain locations. And then we resolve infections within certain locations so like supermarkets and schools. And then at the end, we have a simple blanket equation for modeling on transport. What is quite important perhaps to convey, not all the details, I don't think I have time for that, but the main thing is we don't have R as any input parameter. What we use instead as sort of a baseline input is a rather curious metric, which is about the likelihood that an infectious person will infect a susceptible person on a four square meter area for 24 hours assuming that it is indoors and not so well ventilated um, we took some papers from prisons and cruise ships to try and home in on this approximate value is not set in stone by any means but the value that we sort of have consensus on internally was for the original version of COVID around seven percent and then for the uh, the alpha version about 10 11 percent and that is what we use as a baseline metric that value might not be correct, but we felt it was a little bit more grounded than just using R. Uh, and that is that's certainly open for debate. It's just, yeah, for us, uh, a different way to approach things. And um, yeah, then we have this equation to basically say, okay, this is the likelihood that a susceptible person may get infected. And it has all sorts of terms that I can could explain if I had more time. <laughs> okay. Now, so we have agents, they move around. There's a probability that people get infected in certain locations. So there are a lot of sources of uncertainty. A, a couple of them, not all of them, but a couple of them include aleatoric uncertainty. The code is definitely non-deterministic, especially on this local area. The variability is high. It's really, really high. And if you run fewer than 10 simulations, you're going to get a very large error bar just from that uncertainty. Uh, there's uncertainty in the underlying assumptions, of course, like vaccination, efficacy but also compliance with lockdown measures or mask wearing um, and that we stratify in different scenarios each of them with different assumptions which is very limited but yeah we can't do five trillion runs so you have to make painful trade-off somewhere and then of course there's uncertainty in expected future lockdown or perhaps even release interventions and there again what we did for all the reports for the for the nhs trust was make different scenarios and be very clear about what assumptions we made now there is so much uncertainty and the model itself is not super cheap so um it's really hard to cope with uncertainty and i don't say dealing with uncertainty because that implies that we solve it now it's coping like you know you're being attacked by uncertainty you're trying not to just die on the spot um and yeah it's you know during the lockdown we also had a lot of quite tight deadlines where they wanted us to try and provide a prediction we tried to be transparent and very clear about what we could and couldn't be confident about um, and then also a lot of it was voluntary effort people doing this on top of their normal workload and we found that there were three factors really important to try and do things a bit better the first one that i think all of you can relate to is to find and adopt efficient but also widely and easily applicable algorithms for sensitivity analysis because the thing is when you're working in this regime, you can't really do an in-depth feasibility study. So you just like to have things off the shelf that you can apply relatively easily. The second thing that I'm very familiar with is just to use supercomputers to save time computing, that you're not waiting weeks or months to get a forecast, even if you have to do a thousand or 5,000 runs. And the third one is actually the most important, uh, but I think quite undervalued by many. And that's to try and save time and money spent on toiling researchers try to automate everything that people don't have to do and i think those are the three directions where you can actually move the frontier on this i think everything else is very often a trade-off on the spectrum between perfect uncertainty quantification with an oversimplified model or really bad uncertainty quantification on a hyper-realistic model 
and many other efforts i think will sh just shift on that scale and i think those three elements are essential to try and move it further okay just very briefly this is a very old result i should have dug up an earlier one uh, where we run the borough of brent for an hour so that's why you see the ensemble sort of dying at the end um, and then here a very simple piece of validation data not all our validations were that accurate but uh, we did happen to be extremely pessimistic and extremely accurate particularly in the autumn lockdown and uh, even more so in the january lockdown so it, perhaps it was more coincidence than anything but we we got the peak in january uh, 21 pretty much spot on when we sent our reports to the trust um, which is great but in retrospect there was definitely a coincidental factor to that and the code you know the code is hard, is really really new and it needs a lot more work um, but yeah we are able to make these uh, kind of uh, forecasts and this is not the total uncertainty don't let yourself be deluded by that this is just you know 10 15 runs and we just put you know uh, an, an error bar on that but that's not the real uncertainty the real uncertainty we cannot tell at this stage uh, here's some other example results so some of the things that is nice when you resolve individual buildings is you can look at individual wards and actually look at individuals on the ward level so you can try and identify some hotspots that map to actual physical locations and another thing that is really nice is that we can actually look at infections by different location types so we can see like okay the office you know the work from home directive was effective but school closure was not effective or things like that or more mask wearing in the supermarket works well so you have a really nice fine granularity of being able to analyze the, the results, even if the uncertainty of the code is, is still high. Okay, the last bit I have here is a little bit about sensitivity analysis. How much time do I still have? Okay, so very quickly. Um, so yeah, basically, as a you can read more about it actually in the paper up above because that's where we mentioned it. But what we did was basically a very yeah, sort of straightforward uh, sobel sensitivity analysis using stochastic co-location, taking a few of what we thought the more major parameters in the, in the simulation for a single borough, run 15,000 instances of facts uh, on the Eagle supercomputer and use the FACMA toolkit to try and quantify the, uh, the sensitivity. And uh, this is more or less what we got it, what we got. So at, you can basically see that at the start of the pandemic, so this starts on the 1st of March, you see that a lot of factors are at play with the initial burst of infections and then later on you see that a couple of parameters are really starting to dominate things so the mild recovery period is actually uh, reasonably important but then the infection rate uh, which you can see at the top is uh, yeah it's becoming the dom dominant factor so uh, yeah as a summary i have one slide after this uh, so the code has been partially validated, but we need to do a lot more there, a lot better. It's uh, definitely deserves a lot of attention. We managed to make some forecasts for the general public. So there were a few articles that we made. Um, in retrospect, the forecasts were spot on. The code wasn't necessarily entirely correct, but at least the forecast seemed to, uh, to, yeah, to, fit, to fit well. And uh, yeah, we added a range of features and also made the whole code a bit more robust, solved bugs over the time. And our current focus is very much on scaling up and uh, testing the parallel implementation, uh, improving in particular the validation and the uncertainty quantification. And with that parallel version, we also want to enable province level runs and yeah, working towards a countrywide uh, forecast. The very last thing I just wanted to say is that I'm the local chair for the International Conference on Computational Science, uh, which is hosted at Brunel this year for the first time in the UK since 2009. So if you're interested in participating with that, uh, there is a track chaired by Walter Edeling on uncertainty quantification that could be interesting. Uh, and the deadline for it is the 18th of, uh, of February. Thank you very much. <laughs> so do we have any questions from Um, not what we I haven't actually uh, discovered that so my background is computer science so I came into the literature very much from the outside 
and initially I think we're very much gravitated towards COVID themed papers. Um, we didn't find his work, uh, presumably because he didn't explicitly cover COVID initially. Um, but I am happy to learn about his papers because uh, we are updating the rule set quite frequently, actually. Yeah. On household models, there's also work by Thomas House. I don't know whether you've seen that. So they've been doing work um, looking at the ONS data, trying to resolve it to, to look in the UK at household because they get they've got a lot of information on the households from the ONS data. So transmission within the house. Um, yeah, so like uh, and so they've got sort of household models that mm -hmm. they're trying to understand um, about household transmission from ONS data. So you might want to look. They've got some preprints that they've just released, so you might want to. Yeah, in the case of facts, the the transmission within family or within internal households is actually really simplistic. It's just a simple equation, and I think it'd be very interesting to actually elaborate a little bit on that. So. Yeah, if, if you could share like names or links for that, that would be really useful. Thank you. Yeah. From the floor, any online? No? No? Well, I guess if there's no more questions, then um, we'll thank our speaker again. Um, and move to a discussion um, session and roundup session. So I think the plan was that I think Peter, are you going to present a few 